Good morning and welcome to our Daily Word and Prayer. My name is Tom Short. So glad to have you along with us today. So we get into the Word of God, talk about it. And uh, this morning I'd like to share, I know people always enjoy when I share a story, a personal story, something that's happened recently from the campus or whatever. Yesterday, I've got a story from just yesterday, when a priest and a preacher sat on a plane next to one another. No, this is not the opening line of a joke. And there was not a rabbi in the third seat. But it is a good story because I got on the plane and after a grueling week on the campus, only about three and a half hours sleep the night before, before getting up early to get to the plane, um, I was ready to get on the plane and take a nap. Now, I have this gift of being able to sleep on planes. A lot of people can't do it. It's no problem for me. As a matter of fact, the engine noise puts me to sleep and I'm often before we even take off, I'm often sound asleep. But this time my seat was right next to a guy who was extremely friendly and extremely chatty. He was had, had a comment about everyone walking down the aisle and the, the plane was late and the weather outside and what he was doing and where he was going and, and on and on and on he talked. And I soon realized, unless I'm going to be just really rude, I'm not going to get a nap on this plane. I'm going to have to be listening and engaging and talking. And he on and on he went. And as I looked over at him, I realized after about 10 minutes, he's wearing a priest collar. And I asked him, I said, are you a priest? He said, yes, he's going back. He graduated at a seminary that's just about a you know, few minutes from my house. You can walk to it in about 10 minutes, 5, 10 minutes. It's, it's close by. And, uh, and there's a Catholic seminary, and I was aware of it, and I've been by there. We, so we started talking. I got to say a few words about, uh, you know, I've been there, and we used to play basketball there as a kid and so forth. And as we went on and on, more and more stories, more and more stories about his, upbringing, his time there and so forth, I was trying to figure out how can I make this into, turn this into a, more of a spiritual conversation instead of just small talk. And so I asked him a question. Now, by the way, at this point, he had no idea who I was, what I do, if I'm a Christian, nothing. I've been primarily listening to his stories. And I said, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. And I said, listen, what would you tell a Protestant who wanted to know how to get to heaven? Without hesitating, he kind of changed into priest mode, shall we say. He came from this very jovial, friendly effervescent, bubbling over type guy. He got real serious and he just said simply, love God and love your neighbor. That's what you got to do. I said, really? Is that it? He said, yes, that's everything that he said. That's what Jesus taught. The Ten Commandments, he said that love God is the first three commandments. We'd say the first four. And the love your neighbors, the last seven, he said. If you do that, if you love your neighbor, you'll keep the Ten Commandments. So that's what you got to do. Just love your neighbor and you'll be fine. And then he began to divert and talk about other things again. And we got off this subject. About five minutes went by and I said, can we get back to this question we talked about loving God? I said, I, I got another question. I said, what if I, you know, love God, love the neighbors is his answer. I said, what if I've not done a very good job of loving God and loving my neighbor? His answer, he's very, very quick. He said, well, it's never too late to start. Never too late to start. I said, so that's, I mean, just start now loving God, loving my, that's it. Just start loving God, loving your neighbor. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And then we were talking about something else. He, he began to get onto something else. And after a while, I wanted to get back to it. I said, well, you know, can I tell you what I do? I said, I'm in Christian ministry too. I go to college campuses. I talk to students about God and how they can have eternal life, how they can know they're going to heaven, how they can live out their Christian life in their college years and beyond. And I said, your answer, that the question how someone could get to heaven, I said, I, I think you kind of left something out pretty important that I, would have, that I would always make sure and say. He got serious. He looked at me. He said, well, what's that? And I said, you didn't mention Jesus. You didn't mention Jesus. You didn't mention that Jesus died for us. He sacrificed himself for our sins. You didn't mention it. He said, well, that's obvious. It's Jesus. 
it's obvious that you, you wouldn't love God if it weren't for Jesus. You wouldn't love other you wouldn't love other people if it weren't for Jesus. So it's obvious that there's Jesus there. And I said, yeah, but you know what? You left him out. You forgot to mention him. And somehow I said that when I would talk about this, this would be the central thing I would talk about, faith in Jesus Christ. He said, well, faith isn't enough. By the way, you've got to understand this guy. Again, this was a very friendly conversation, very jovial friend. I'm a very friendly guy. He was a very friendly guy. There was a girl sitting in the seat next to us. I, I kind of chuckled with her afterwards. I said, you've got a story to tell. You, you, you just flew into Columbus with a priest and a preacher in the same aisle as you did. And she chuckled and she'd overheard our conversation. But very friendly. But he said, he said to me, uh, it's obvious that you've got to have Jesus. You can't, you can't love God. You can't love your neighbor without Jesus. And I said, yeah, but you'd left him out. And to me, that's central. That's central. He said, well, it's not enough. I mean, look at those, you know, he said, look at Matthew 25. How's, how are you going to be judged there? If you don't know, Matthew 25 is about do you care for the poor and the weak and the needy, the prisoner, the, the hungry, and so forth. And he said, that's how we'll be judged. And I, and I, I wasn't getting through to him. We weren't agreeing. I'm saying the key to eternal life, the key to salvation is that we have to have faith that Jesus Christ is our, uh, died for our sins and saves us. And he was obviously focusing on it's what we do. I began to point out to him that I asked people this question, if you were dying, God would say, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And if all the answers have to do with something I've done, I did this, I did that, I went to church, I gave money, I did charity, I, I helped the poor, I helped women across, old women across the street, whatever it is, my faith is in me. I'm, my whole hope of eternal life is in me versus what I would say, I said was, I, I would say, I would tell God, if God asked why you should let me in heaven, I would say, because of what Jesus did. My faith is in Jesus. I'm trusting what Jesus did for me. Not that I could do anything to earn my salvation. I'm trusting in Jesus. And his point was, yeah, but that's not enough. That's not enough. Now we were in a pretty good conversation. And it was pretty serious. And, and, the, and, and I could tell that this man, who's about my age, I could tell this man was really contemplating, really thinking and processing some of the things I was saying and somewhat defending Catholicism and traditional theological Catholic doctrine, but he was also, he was thinking about it. I said, can I share my personal story? He said, sure. I told him when I was, I, I grew up in the church and I always thought God loves me. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm not Hitler. I'm not a bad guy. I've never broken the Ten Commandments. I've lived, I mean, I haven't broken the bad ones. I've certainly probably dishonored my parents or taken God's name in vain. But, you know, like the, I've never murdered anyone or committed adultery or some of these, the bad ones. And so I always thought I'm pretty safe. Of course I'll go to heaven. He was not. Yeah, of course you would. And I said, uh, <clears throat> and then I began to read the New Testament for myself. And although I would have always thought I was a sinner, Suddenly, I learned it in a whole new way. I said, if anyone would have asked me if I was a sinner before this, I would have said, of course I am. Everybody's a sinner. And he nodded. This guy nodded his head. And I said, on the other hand, if you would have asked me, does I deserve to be judged by God or go to eternal judgment? I've said, of course not. I've never done any of the big ones. He said, nodded his head. Yeah, of course. Of course, that, I understand that. But then I read, as I read the scripture, and I began to see that Jesus said that he looks at the heart. And Jesus said, you've heard that you should not commit murder, but I say, if, you've, if you've, you're angry in your heart, you are angry with the person you've murdered in your heart, if you say to the person you're good for nothing, fool, you're guilty enough to the fires of hell. And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm, he was aware of those verses. And I said, suddenly I began to realize there's something really wrong with me. And I began to believe deep in my soul that I really was a sinner. Not just a term, not just something, everybody's a sinner. But I began to experience guilt before God, I began to experience there's something wrong with me and I needed to find an answer. 
you've, you've heard my story. I told him where I went to find the answer, the state fair. He kind of chuckled, really? You didn't go to a church or something? No, I went to the state fair to find the answer because I'd known there were people who would have a booth at the, in the, in the, uh, or somehow they'd be out public offering a Bible study or talking to people about God. And I thought anyone who'd go out in public to talk about God like that, they probably got a better answer than someone who just stays in the church. I, I was thinking that even as a teenager. And, uh, and I told him I didn't find anybody, but I found a piece of literature, and it had a verse on it, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. He said, well, you, and he, he said, you quoted that right. I know the Greek on that. A lot of people quote that verse wrong. You quoted it right. And he wanted to talk about the Greek for a bit, and I wanted to talk about the verse. I said, this tells us belief in Jesus, but what does it mean to believe? And this piece of literature went on to say, for a lot of people, there's only 12 inches separating them between heaven and hell. Do you know what that is? He had no idea. He had no idea what that meant. And he said, said so some people, it's only one inch separating between heaven and hell. And I said, well, 12 inches means the distance from the head to the heart. And the Bible says it is with the heart a man believes. And that's something I said, I'd always believed the Christmas story, the Easter story. I never doubted the miracles of Jesus, never doubted the teachings of Jesus, or the ones I knew. But it was all up here. There was nothing in my heart. I was not trusting in Jesus Christ. My faith was in me that I'm good enough, that I've lived up to what God requires of me. I'm going to have no problem in the afterlife because I've been a good enough person. My faith was in me. And it took an awareness of my own sinfulness and how Jesus died on the cross for that sin. Jesus never hated anybody, but it's like God took my hatred and he put it on Jesus. Jesus was never, he didn't have the sin, not only the outward sins, he didn't have the sins of the heart that I was, that I was so convicted of in my own life. And it's like God took those from me and put them on Jesus and then punished Jesus on my behalf. I must tell you, as we talked, the, the, the conversation turned quite serious. And suddenly, this guy began to think of other verses. He said, on that day of that judgment, I'm, I'm not going to answer. I have an advocate. And he was aware that he said, yes, Jesus is our advocate. I believe yesterday, this fellow, I won't call him a young man because he was, you know, he's in his 60s. And, he, and uh, a priest and responsibilities I think he may have had a moment of seeing and putting together some things that maybe he hadn't before. I often say that with the gospel, lots of times we talk to people who have a religious background, Protestant or Catholic, they all agree Jesus died for them. They all agree they're a sinner, but, but until they put two and two together, see, that's what happened with me when I read that pamphlet. It helped me put two and two together. I'm a sinner. Christ died for my sins. What does that really mean? Aha. He, I personalized it. I began, I told this priest, I said, one thing that changed my vocabulary after that, I, I still believe Christ died for the sins of the world. But now I began to say Christ died for my sins. He became my Savior. This became personal. I had sin. Jesus died for that. And now I'm the child of God. Um, pretty cool story, pretty divine appointment being able, I think probably he was kind of a loud speaker. I'm not the quietest guy. Probably some people around the plane heard our story as well, but I thought I would share that with you today. And I thought I'd ask you, do you have a story like that? Do you have a story where Jesus went from being the savior of the world to being your savior? He personalized it. He said, yes, I've sinned. I, there's something wrong with me. I'm in trouble. Jesus is the answer. He rescues me. I'm counting on Jesus. That's what it means to have faith in him. I'm counting on Jesus. I'm relying on Jesus. I'm trusting in Jesus. He's the one who's going to save me. That's the good news. I blacked out in the photo. I blacked out his eyes. I didn't want to share this story about him without, you know, I didn't want to, you know, maybe someone would know him or someone in his parish or his church or even here at the seminary. I didn't want to you know, say something that might embarrass him, but we should pray for him. And I want to pray for all of us that we'd know the, this, we'd put two, to two, two and two together. What's it really mean 
If Christ died for our sins, sin is what keeps us from God. Sin is what separates us from God. And we don't make up for our sin by doing enough good stuff to compensate for our sins. That's where Jesus died for our sins. That's what compensates for our sins. God doesn't have this big scale up there, good deeds versus bad deeds, and you know, sins versus acts of righteousness. Whichever one has the most, you go to heaven. No, our sin separates us from God. Christ died for sins. That's of first importance. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, I delivered to you what I also received, of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Let's pray about it. Father in heaven, I thank you today for that divine appointment yesterday. And I pray for my friend as I sat there on the plane with him, that he might have a new, fresh understanding and put together these things that he's learned and believed, but maybe didn't see how they all work together. As it was pretty clear, he was trusting in his own goodness and his own good works, and, and he'd lived such a life of service to other people, and he'd done so much. And yet, Lord, all of us are sinners, and all of us need to plead the blood of Jesus, and all of us need to be rescued and saved by our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that yesterday might have been an enlightenment for him to understand the grace of God in a whole new way. And I pray for each one of us. Lord, I thank you for my salvation. Thank you for that day 50 some years ago where you opened my eyes to see what it really meant that Christ died for my sins. Open the eyes of anyone here today who might not have ever understood that to to receive and to believe in their heart. Jesus, you are the one who gave your life to save us. We can't save ourselves. We can only be saved by you. We bless you and we love you. We give you this day to follow you and to show our love for you, our gratitude for all you've done in giving your life for us. We thank you and bless you now in Jesus' holy name. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, thanks for being with me today. I hope you enjoyed this story. And I hope it motivates you to even find some ways you can share your faith. As we were in the middle of that conversation, what would you tell a guy, I asked him, what would you tell a Protestant? And it quickly switched from just a bunch of stories to some real dealing with a person's soul. Have some good questions you can talk to people. Bring it up. It's never out of place to ta talk to a person about their soul. It might seem like it, but it never is. So glad you're along. If you're new, a special welcome. I hope you join our channel regularly. Come here. We're here every morning live at 8.30 a.m. And we're also, later in the day, you can watch or even listen to the podcast on the Apple, Spotify, or Google platform. I hope you subscribe to the channel, share with your friends, like the video, tell others about this time, post it on your social media. To those of you here every day, God bless you. I love you. So glad to have you along. Until we meet tomorrow, you have a blessed day. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.